that we are getting pretty close to the end of, the remake of Final Fantasy VII, but we have a surprising amount that we still have to go. This last dungeon really is crawling a little bit along. It's a lot of sort of this back and forth kind of thing, a Final Fantasy VI dungeon, Final Dungeon thing. I have to say that um, I guess it works all right as a Final Dungeon. Is this really the exit? I hate that man. I really do. <laughs> What it takes to get Aerith to say that she hates somebody. Kind of a weird personality she had. Because you never saw her getting angry. I guess you maybe saw her getting a little bit sad at points. But you never saw her actually getting angry at anybody. And if there's anybody here... I mean, I guess all of these characters really do have reasons to be angry. Especially at Shinra. She was sort of kidnapped as a baby and sort of held by Shinra for... A number of years until she finally escaped as her mother died and uh, you know I guess everybody though is kind of got plenty of reason to have hate though kind of a reoccurring thing with all of these characters I've definitely mentioned it before but they are all sort of especially the members of Avalanche and even the characters that came along later but they all sort of had their own justifications for what they're doing all okay. while we're helping to save the planet this and all this other kind of thing but all of them had these sort of not ulterior motives but kind of their own history their own reason to hate Shinra and the sort of environmentalist message was really just sort of an excuse for them to murder people whatever Usually, I hate the idea of one of these RPGs that, at some point, strip your main character out of the group and force you to play as other characters. Usually, it's because you would have, oftentimes, these situations where you're, you sort of gain your main core group of characters that you like to play as. They're around for all of the leveling that you do, you not only gain like gameplay experience with them, you actually like learn how to play those characters better. And they get all the best equipment. So if a game goes and takes that character away, like they did with Cloud in the original Final Fantasy VII at some point, you kind of feel like you've been kind of restrained or held back or handicapped to an extent because your most powerful character isn't there anymore. This game, it doesn't happen so much because it forces you to play as all of the characters. There really isn't a PHS system in this game where you can swap out characters and only play as the ones you want. Which the original Final Fantasy VII during these parts of the story didn't give you many opportunities to choose who you wanted to play as. So, I mean, it makes sense from that point. You think now the others can get across too? I'm not really getting the perspective that Cloud is in a. Spe I guess maybe he is a little bit more powerful than everyone else. Normally, when you have a main character, that ba for in my opinion anyway, the the best balance to achieve with your main character is have your your lead character, I should say, be pretty well balanced in all regards, like good, decent magic, decent physical strength, defense, all that kind of stuff. But you, instead of being like just middle all the way across the board, sort of give them a little bit of an edge in every character category. Little bit above average strength, a little bit above average magic, a little bit above average defense, and all that kind of stuff. Essentially, meaning the character is the most, um, the most, well, what's the word I'm looking for? The most well rounded, I guess. It's not the word, but it'll do. The character is the most well rounded, 
but isn't sort of like a jack of all trades, master of none kind of thing because he's actually relatively strong in comparison hey, to everybody. Cloud? We used the control panel here a little while ago, so you should be able to get to the other side. Can you check? Roger that. I'm getting pretty bored anyway. You two stay there. We'll call if anything comes up. Okay. Be careful. Anyway, that would mean that your character, your main character, is the most powerful but not in any way that would make him just, like, outright the best at everything kind of thing. This game, maybe they've done that. I uh, have a hard time figuring out, like, what... I didn't bother, like, running the numbers or paying attention to all that kind of stuff to determine if Cloud actually just does more damage than everybody or than most of the characters or half the, half the average of the characters. I don't know. Um, maybe he does... I guess I could look it up. I mean, the wiki, uh, the fan wiki of this game would probably have that information. Has it for the original game, I guess. But anyway. <laughs> Transfusion procedure complete. Commencing test of augmented research specimen. Anyway, the, um, since you have to play as all the characters in this early portion of the game, all the characters get their different weapons, and they can all use the same armor, but you tend to get a lot of armor, you're getting a lot of materia, haven't felt the need to buy any of it, so nobody's getting sort of preferential treatment in terms of all that kind of stuff. I'm not really buying armor either. And none of the characters seem to have an enormous disadvantage I guess, uh, this game doesn't really have that problem. The original Final Fantasy VII did seem a little, a little bit, um, unusual, because the earlier games, um, I'm not quite sure when it was, the job system, anyway, made sure that all of your characters had a very distinctive feel to them. They had different, dramatically different abilities, uh, not just stats like attack and defense and all that kind of stuff, but they had different like magic abilities or physical techniques and all that kind of stuff. And that was something that Final Fantasy VII definitely sort of changed. You didn't, you sort of had a job system, and your characters were not all just complete carbon copies of each other. There were differences in stat growth and leveling and all that kind of stuff. Like, like Tifa, for example, had high attack power because she's a monk class, but her HP was lower. So she's a little bit of a, in a sense, a little bit of a glass cannon. But the differences in seven were sort of downplayed in comparison to the differences that you've seen in the earlier games. They weren't as significant. I hope you're enjoying your experience. Why don't you come down here and ask me? Before you get any ideas, you should know this glass is bulletproof. No discernible changes after contact. Most fascinating. Hey! We ain't done yet! It seems we have no choice. So it would, it would mean that since the characters weren't significantly different in terms of their stats, there were differences, they weren't enormous, you would have a character like who's not intended to be, say, a magic casting character like Tifa or Barrett. Neither of them are really intended to be casting characters. But, you know what? They have materia slots. You can put magic on them. Why the hell wouldn't you? And even though they aren't as good as, say, like, Aerith or Cloud or, you know, whoever the fuck else I'm talking about, it still made perfect sense for you to go and 
utilize them as casting characters because you know there may be a need when you need to cast some lightning or like in this fight <laughs> or healing and you're gonna want to put that material on the characters even if that means that the stat ch the, the character's stats actually change with material use like magic material has a tendency to lower your character's hp i think i said this in the last episode magic material will lower your character's hp uh, summon material will lower their HP even more significantly. So if you have a character like Tifa, which is already low in terms of HP, you're going to further diminish that, uh, further um, magnify that weakness she has by sticking materia on her. But still, though, even though you're taking her weakest attribute and you're making it even weaker, it's still absolutely worth it to at least give her some materia. I, I mean, I would not cram her full of materia, but you can certainly do it, and it's worth it to at least stick a few pieces of materia on her. Well, why the hell would I get on this? I'm tired. <laughs> oh, Joe, what a real asshole. That's what I was talking about, right? This is definitely a big change here in the way that Hojo is sort of toying with our characters. Because, as I keep referring back to the original game, Hojo wasn't some kind of a mastermind over the situation that you were in when you were in the Shinda Tower, in the original game, anyway. He just kind of... He was unaware of your existence until all of a sudden you appeared and went and rescued Aerith and then tried to make your escape. Right once he uh, once he ran off after you pulled her out of the tube, you don't see him again until I don't know maybe Costa del Sol or something like that. So this is definitely a change. I guess you needed somebody to work as a sort of an antagonist during this part of the game because it was going to stretch on for so long. Now's our chance to kill the bastard. Time for you to pay the piper. Mm -hmm. They never learn. Commencing test. All personnel must evacuate area. Commencing test. Like Red might need our help up there. Hojo had his own motivations and his own um, things that he was doing in the original game. As it turns out, as you get towards the end of the game, you find out that he was in fact Sephiroth's father, and he was at some point started working towards aiding Sephiroth. You know, uh, tried blowing up. A Mako reactor and in uh, Midgar towards the end of the game summoning all the planet energy all that kind of shit but you didn't until that point really get the impression that Hojo had some great master plan he was just more or less working for Shinra doing what Shinra had to do and in fact a lot of the characters seem to regard Hojo as being not even particularly intelligent just sort of um, somebody who hung on to the coattails of Professor Gast, and then he he um, 
took over the situation once Gas was murdered. Here they're making him, like, I, I, I don't know if you'd want to call him smarter here, but definitely more malicious with the way of everything that he's doing. He's not... Um, he's not just some detached scientist, which is the way he came across to me, at least through this part of the early game. He's coming across more like, oh, well, he's just some, some evil prick that enjoys torturing our characters and claiming it's some kind of um, science experiment to watch them fight his creations. And really, I think he just sort of gets off on trying to murder these people. But, you know, whatever. They did have to make changes, and I'm going to accept that. You're not going to just recreate the original game unless it's like a shot for shot kind of remake like kind of a like a demon souls for the ps5 kind of thing they did change quite a bit about this and they had to stretch it out so there were going to be a lot of changes i can't say that i like all of the changes that were done but i understand that changes did have to happen and you know that's one there not that hojo was a well-beloved character or anything anyway i certainly didn't it's just a minor antagonist that reappears every once in a while, and then turns out he has some other shit going on. So, you know, whatever. Using a lot of items in this game for healing. Something you tend not to do in RPGs. Get out of here! What was that thing? Where's Hojo? Sorry, he got away. Forget about him for now. That was something else I'd noticed about this game. A lot of RPGs are sort of... Japanese RPGs, I should say. Are set up in a way that you don't want to be overly reliant on items. Because items are finite and they cost money to replace, and all that kind of stuff. So, you're sort of, whenever you... Whenever you... Uh, head off into a dungeon, you get a feeling there's only so far you can make through there, because it's going to be based on how much money you're able to accumulate to buy items to keep you alive. But, since items are so expensive, you're going to want to rely more on, say, magic or some other means of restoring your character's hit points and magic points and all that kind of stuff. In this game, even though you do have, like, cure material and all that kind of stuff, you tend to be a lot more reliant on items, which feels weird because the dungeons are so long. But they sort of balance that out by just throwing an insane number of items at you and and materia for that matter too. Test subjects don't receive treatment. They're enhanced or dissected. This has a real piece of work. Now what? Hey! Let us out! I remember you. But he remembers us, I think. Well, I'd noticed almost immediately that I needed to use a lot of items to keep my characters alive. And it was really awkward for a little while, because I felt like that was playing the game wrong. Definitely didn't throw a lot... I mean, early on in uh, the, fir the original Final Fantasy VII, you tend to use a lot of items because you don't have the... Not all of your characters have the cure materials and all that kind of stuff. So weird. God, this game is so weird. <laughs> you tend to rely on items earlier in the game and then as your characters get stronger or get more abilities or something like that, you find a way of not relying so much on that, but... Eventually, you know, you stop using items so much. In this, though, I tended to use 
I'm maybe a little bit less later on in the game, but I tended to use items a lot more in this than I did in the earlier games. Also, the... I mean, there is... There's a uh, MP, so... Eh, whatever. The ATB gauge is... is and you know what? I don't want to get into that. Kind of weird that that cloud, a lot of his old limit breaks are kind of... A lot of his old limit breaks are just abilities that you just need to build up the ATB gauge to use. Man, this is a frustrating... I, honestly, I played this game. I played all of my footage. I played quite a while ago. And I'm slowly crawling my way through it, making episodes for this series. So... I don't. I didn't even remember this fight, but this looks like the most frustrating shit ever. These things are everywhere, and it's probably the case that only one of them is real, and you have to kill it. Or maybe you have to. Maybe you need to kill all of them. I don't know, but there are so damn many of them that you're stop. Effective with stop status. There you go. Finally got one busted. You know, if you had um, a character that was better with magic here, like you had Aerith, and you can ma somehow manage to keep her from getting smacked because your um, magic, your magic casting can be interrupted, just like all of your attacks can be interrupted. You could do this large area of effect magic yeah. attacks. You probably could have done quite well in this fight. I didn't try magic, though. Cloud could have done decent magic attacks. There we go, throwing items out like, like you're nothing. Like, do you think these things grow on trees? Come on, now. Fine. One step at a time it is. I'll let Tifa and Aerith know. What do you know? That's the door to the fourth wall. If we want to get in, we'll need to go all the way back to the central terminal. But the door we used to get here is shut, so what now? The passages have to be connected somehow. How do they not realize by this point that they don't have to go all the way back? You have these other characters that could do this stuff. These vending machines... I must have mentioned this at some point earlier, but... It's... I, I kind of like the idea of having proper shops... But this game doesn't really have the opportunity to do that. Because it, the dungeons are so long that you'll throw these shops in here in order to extend the amount of time that you can be running through them. Because like I said a few minutes back, a lot of the a lot of JRPGs, you sort of have a certain kind of tension when you're going through a dungeon because there's only so much so many resources you have to burn through as you're progressing through the dungeon. So, let's say I buy 15 potions at the beginning of the dungeon. I can only use those 15 by the time I get to the other side. If I run out of potions, I could potentially run out of HP and die in there. They extend this in this game by not only throwing a lot of items they can find in boxes and chests and all that kind of stuff, but by putting these vending machines in the middle of dungeons so you can replenish your stocks halfway through. I'd kind of prefer if they didn't have to resort to this because these dungeons do feel like they're too long. I do want to run into a town on the other side of a dungeon. Of course the way the story is set up that's not really a possibility here but I want to feel like that I want to have that certain sense of relief to getting to the other side of a dungeon and not spending two or three hours running through it. 
this does not make any fucking sense. <laughs> It's a PHS terminal. Call up Tifa. See if they can get to the central terminal. Hey! You okay down there? Whoa. How the hell does Red 13 able to sort of... At least he doesn't even come back to help us out. <laughs> Red 13 is able to, to matrix his ass across the wall. Like, what the hell does he need our help getting out of here for? Damn it! Red! Shit! He can't hold them all forever! You should go right. Right. On it. Tifa, you there? Is something wrong? Red fell to your level. Can you try to get to him? Oh no! Come on! Alright, I'm gonna use that changeover as the opportunity to... Oh look, Red 13's running out of life. <laughs> I'm gonna use this changeover as the opportunity to end the episode. Yeah.